start with a question. The moment I walked into this room, what was the first thought that came to your mind? Woman, covered hair, Muslim, question mark. But let me tell you this, that beneath this headscarf is a child whose parents believed in her more than they believed in themselves. I was born and raised in Pakistan, and contrary to popular belief, no, we do not live in caves, and yes, we do have McDonald's. Actually, our McDonald's delivers. <laughs> but that's besides the point. Getting back to the subject, I was born and raised in Pakistan, and I moved to America around three years ago for college. And since I currently live 7,000 miles away from my parents, I spend most of my day reliving my childhood memories. And while reading Charlie and the Chocolate Factory with my mom at night comes in as a close second, my most cherished memory is from exactly 10 years ago, when I was standing on a stage just like this, singing Michael Jackson's We Are the World, We Are the Children, uh, with my middle school choir. And I remember that while we were singing, my parents stood up from the crowd and started clapping to the beat. And the entire audience joined in, and they all started singing with us. That day, my 12-year-old self felt like she was on top of the world. Pun intended, because that's another song I sang that day. <laughs> Anywho, today, um, that day I ma made me realize that my childhood is filled with countless such instances where my parents made me believe that I could conquer the world, regardless of my age and gender from the way uh, mommy clapped her hands after I played off-key tunes on the piano, to the way papa calls me his hira bacha, roughly translated as his diamond child, my parents genuinely boosted my confidence and showed their support no matter what. They supported my decisions no matter if, it, if they were spiritual or academic or extracurricular. They made me believe that I could do whatever I wanted. And today, I see myself as a strong young woman who identifies herself as a Muslim. I love to do photography because, as you can see, my mother literally documented every moment of my childhood <laughs> through her Canon lens. I am a writer because I saw my grandfather spend countless hours working on his manuscript, which is actually, th that picture at the end is of me and my sister with our grandfather from a book of his. And I see myself as someone who's passionate about healthcare because I saw my aunt change lives through her medicine. And I'm a weird tech geek who loves to stay up to date with the up and coming gadgets because my parents supported that geeky side of me and got me my first computer when I was seven, even though it was a toy. <laughs> Anywho, um, when I was 16, I started reading Muslim scriptures. And I realized, I, I came across one of these quotations of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that said, make use of five before five. Your health before your uh, sickness, your wealth before your poverty, your youth before your old age, your uh, wealth, um, your, uh, your free time before you're preoccupied, and your life before your death. So when my 16-year-old self read those words, that was like a eureka moment for me. And I had found my personal mission statement. So I spent countless days, okay, let's be realistic, not countless, a week. <laughs> I spent a week thinking of ways I could implement that quotation and put it into practice. So I decided, why not go into the nonprofit world? I started very small and I started off volunteering for um, nonprofits and welfare organizations in Pakistan, such as SOS Children's Village and Rising Sun Institute. But considering the proactive teenager that I was, I felt very limited by the opportunities that were available to me. So I decided to go big, and I started my own projects. A funny incident that comes to mind is from March 2014, yeah, exactly three years ago when my mother answered the door and she found two gigantic trucks parked in our driveway. She went to the truck drivers and asked what they were for. And she found out that her daughter, Aliha, me, had decided to start a fundraiser with her friend 
And um, for Thar Parker, for drought victims in Thar Parker, a desert in southern Pakistan. And wait for it. Not only does she plan to raise funds, she also plans to now pack $15,000 worth of food items, imagine wheat, barley, sugar, into 500 food packs and transport them to a desert that is 900 miles away from the city we were in. <laughs> At first, like any sane adult, she panicked. And she refused to believe me when I said, Mommy, I can do it, you wouldn't have to do a thing. Little did I know, I mean. So after like three hours and countless eye rolls later, she realized that I had started losing my confidence and my energy and my optimism were dropping by the minute. And I wasn't even done with my 50th food packs yet. So she did what she had been doing my entire life. She supported my idiotic idea. And she called my dad and my younger siblings and they all joined in and helped me pack for the rest of the 450 food packs without saying a word, although they probably thought I was crazy. And thanks to their help that day, I was able to transport those 500 food packs all the way to Thar Parker as promised, and also fund two deeply dug wells for the victims over there. So looking back at that incident, I realized that my parents' support has engendered this deeply ingrained you can do it attitude in me, that not only turned me into the mature and a more independent person for my age that I am, not to toot my own horn, but, <laughs> but it also helped me get over my crippling sense of self-pity when I was diagnosed with a chronic metabolic disorder in my late teens, because of which I had to take a gap year from school and put an abrupt life, a stop to my life. And that very attitude gave me the confidence to found my own nonprofit when I was 21, that has, not only, that has helped more than 5,000 underprivileged patients in just one year. And I'm not even a college graduate as yet. So um, subconsciously, since I was raised in a household where my parents supported my ideas, I subconsciously followed their footsteps and did the exact same thing with my younger siblings, Bernie and Mahin, who were 11 and 6 at the time. And I, my interaction with them over the years had made me realize how insightful children can be. But I never truly understood the magnitude of their potential when I, about two years ago, I had this conversation with the baby of our house, Mahin, um, and he made a very complex connection during our conversation. So this is what I did. I started this awareness activity at home. That was my attempt to make Bernia a proactive preteen. So we'd read a book about that highlighted a social concern. And we would, after the book was done, we discussed how we could play our role as individuals to alleviate the problem, if not completely eliminate it. So by the time we reached our third book, I found out that Bernia hated reading, like hated it. And that was a very heartbreaking realization for me since I myself am an avid reader. So I was pretty disheartened and I thought the plan was falling through the cracks. But to my surprise, I found out that Mahin, who was four at the time and used to sit in on our book discussions, seemed pretty interested in the idea and wanted to continue with the project. And a conversation that I distinctly remember having with him was when we were reading this book about this five-year-old child in Africa who starts an entire healthcare system for her village uh, just to help the people in her community. So since we were reading that book, we ended up discussing things about personal hygiene and public health care. And I suddenly in ended up introducing the concept of smoking being injurious to health. Yes, I did that to a four-year-old. So when I was reading the book to him, he attentively listened to what I had to say. And he made me stop for a second and asked me, Ali Habaji, do you smoke? Since smoking is looked down upon, especially for women in the culture that I come from, I straight away said, no, Mahin, of course not. Why would you say that? No, 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 I've never smoked, promise. And he very innocently asked again, then why are you sick all the time? Although at that moment, I could not come up with a satisfying answer for that little four-year-old brain to tell him why his sister was sick, I did, however, realize how, if that child could make such a complex connection and exhibit such insight, imagine what he could do if that potential was directed into the right direction. So here's what I did. 
Every time I started a new, non, a new charity project, I made sure that Bernia and Mahin were an equal part of it. From planning to uh, collecting donations to actually executing the whole plan with our very own hands. So the very first project that we started was in 2012. Okay. Was in 2012 called the Children's Toy Drive. We would start planning a month in advance. We would start spamming our friends for donations. There was a point where my friends put me on a block list because I used to spam them so much and my friends in the audience who know me know how persistent and annoying I can be. And we, once we, were, we used to go to people's houses to collect those donations and then we would used to go to stores to collect, get all the toys. And then a week before Eid, which is a Muslim holiday that we celebrate, we used to distribute, uh, pack all those goodie bags and then distribute them on the day of Eid and help bring happiness to those children who were spending their happy day in a not so pleasant hospital ward, just like I had to once when I was on my gap year. So uh, we, last, we started our project in 2012 and by 2016, this year, we were able to like, distribute 1,500 goodie bags in 2016, all because of Purnia and Mahan's efforts. So um, later on, I founded my own nonprofit and I realized that why not take my parents' legacy a step further? So I made sure that Bernie and Mahin could use my foundation as a platform where they could implement their ideas and see them turn into actions. So now I see my mother who manages the on-site management of the foundation in Lahore while I manage everything online from New York. And then Bernie and Mahin accompany her to each and every health camp that we've held so far. Um, and their interaction with Barkat so far, with the nonprofit so far, has made me realize how in the past just six months, they've morphed into tiny, responsible individuals of their society that have become, have understood how to be a productive human of your community or a, a productive being of your community uh, before they could even watch a PG-13 movie. So now I see, when I went back home this winter break, I saw Pernia uh, re, uh, distribute medication with her pharmaceutical expert. I mean, how many of us over here can read a, hand, a doctor's handwriting? <laughs> I'm a pre-dental student, I can't do that. That 11-year-old can. I saw Mahin, who was distributing tokens to our patients, and when he realized that his task wasn't serious enough, he f argued with me and forced me to change his duty and make him do the medicine inventory, a task I was very reluctant to give to a six-year-old. <laughs> My siblings just are weird. And I just gave in to his request because I didn't want him to feel that I didn't think he was smart enough to do that thing. And once the camp was over, I recounted all the medication and I tallied my list with the list he had and I realized it was 100% accurate. Now, um, that, that now that I've implemented this idea in my very own household for almost five years now, I've kind of realized what a humongous impact this can have. And I finally realized that I had fulfilled my goal when I got a phone call from Pernia a few months ago saying that she wanted to initiate a fundraiser in her school for, with her classmates to help out the patients that we help at our camps. So I, being, I was very excited, I encouraged her and we started discussing how we'd go about the whole thing until we had an argument. So Pernia was of the idea that we should let people donate as much as they want no minimum limit, no max limit. I was of the opinion that Pernia, we should have at least a minimum of a dollar that everyone should donate so that we can have a tangible amount that we raise. So while we were arguing, I accidentally, actually not that accidentally, ended up saying that Pernia, you have no idea what you're talking about. I have more experience in the field, so I get to kind of veto your decision. To which she just said to me, Liha Baji, do you not care about the poor? I will do it and you will see. And she hung up on me. So I took a minute, actually not a minute, an hour, to get over my bruised ego. And I, and I realized that I was doing the exact same thing my mother had done 
when she saw those two gigantic trucks parked in her driveway. So I stepped back and I let Pernia do her thing. And after a week, I got a phone call saying that Pernia and her friends had raised enough funds to sponsor an entire medical camp that helped more than 100 patients. Now, the reason why I bring this up, trust me, my point wasn't here just to share my story. Or maybe it was, because if you ask my friends in the audience, they will tell you how much I love to talk. <laughs> but my point here was to tell you that the nonprofit world has come a long way since the 90s. It was first dominated by men, so we diversified it. We started including women in it, people of color, people from different backgrounds, nations, ethnicities. And then we kind of moved to the younger generation, where we have 21-year-olds starting their own nonprofits. But my question to you is, do we just stop there? Is that it? Is it enough? I think not. We are still ignoring a major resource that we haven't tapped into, our children. Our children's ideas are often undervalued just because they lack experience. So my idea is, why not include them in the nonprofit world and give them the experience that they need instead of passively making them participate in volunteering opportunities. So although my, my dad and my sister Emo, who is in medical school, are not that actively involved with my nonprofit, I know that I can always call my dad up if I'm feeling low and he'll say, Beta, you're my hira bacha, you can do it. Or I will send Emil a text message if I'm confused about something and she will support me even if nobody else does. Or if she thinks I'm wrong, she'll blatantly call me out on it without giving it a second thought. That's how sisters are, unfortunately. The reason why I'm saying all this is that we need to change the system by incorporating our children into the nonprofit world and giving them the experience that they need. When a child comes to an adult with an idea, we often trivialize it by saying it's stupid or childish without realizing how that 10 second rejection can have long term consequences. So I suggest why not come up with ways in which we can empower our children and give them the tools to hone their potential and become the proactive citizens that they have the potential to be. We have micro level actions from let's say having meaningful conversations with your neighbor's child next door to macro level actions of uh, nonprofits and governments starting projects in which they engage children and actively let them think and make decisions. We are planting a seed just like the one that was planted in me exactly 10 years ago when I was standing on a stage just like this singing, we are the world. We are the children. We are the ones who make a brighter day. So let's start giving. There's a choice we're making. We're saving our own lives. It's true, we'll make a better day. Just you and me. Thank you.